Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. As you see, I am here in casual clothes, and that is also the feeling that I would like to express today, because you have connected to an educational seminar of the EPFSF, and it feels a little bit like being back at university, uh, and that for me is a privilege. There are also so many people who want to know about securitization, uh, and this seminar is everything you always wanted to know about securitization, but we're afraid to ask. This morning we have fantastic experts, and we it is really, we like to get to the bottom of this. Before we start, just a few, uh, a few remarks. First, indeed, if you're not speaking, keep, please keep your camera off, and sorry, your camera, but certainly your microphone off, otherwise we hear you getting some fresh coffee and more. And um, this uh, seminar will also be recorded and may be used on social media because we are privileged to have such great experts and, and moderated by Professor Josen today, and we would like to spread the knowledge as far as possible. This educational seminar is organized by the European Parla Parliamentary Financial Services Forum, the EPFSF, which is co-chaired by me with Otmar Karas, Vice President of the European Parliament. The purpose of the EPFSF, which was founded in 1999, is to create a platform for discussion with members of the European Parliament on all items dealing with financial services. And we do that in different ways. We can have uh, dinners, we can have discussion uh, evenings, we can create seminars, but what we can also do is create educational seminars and ask academia and experts to explain us some of the more complex parts of the financial services industry. This uh, session on securitization is important, is important because it's, uh, secu securitization is an important part of the Capital Markets Union Action Plan of the European Commission, and also the topic of the latest call for advice that has been given by the European, uh, to the European supervisory authorities by the Commission. If the latest consultation of the European Commission and call for advice is an indication, we will be talking, for example, about all the fun things, capital requirements, liquidity requirements, supervision of securitization transactions, but also, and very importantly, sustainable securitization. I think we can expect that the Commission will engage in quite a broad review of the framework, and that is necessary, because as I always said, securitization is something that is offered to the market, and if you get the regulation wrong, it is just like a stillborn child, it's not used. Nevertheless, we cannot deny that securitization in itself has become somewhat of a mystery, a kind of a dangerous mystery, which goes back to 2008. It has even been picked up in Hollywood in movies like Margin Call and The Big Short. But these movies are fiction. These film, films lead, uh, give us a lot of entertainment, but we still it has obscured a little bit what securitization is and indeed it can be quite complex which we uh, which is one of the reasons why the EPFSF and kindly helped by the European Bank Federation and AFME the Organization for Financial Markets in Europe uh, has helped to organize this <laughs> session to help you get to grips with the subject and to understand where securitization can play an important role in finance and where it has to play an important role in finance so we won't bombard you with additional jargon but there is one thing that I would like to, uh, to tell you, one message. If we engage in the upcoming review of EU securitization, we need to be able to actually understand deeply what it is and what it is supposed to do. We can, cannot regulate, and that is just for banking experts as it is for members of the European Parliament or anybody engaged in financial services, we cannot regulate anything that we can't understand. And I think that is anyway uh, one of the one of the lessons on any financial regulation. So what we hope to do is give you an introduction, neutral, fact-based, and the speakers will share their real-life exper experience to help you understand the subject. Think of it, as I said, I'm informally dressed because I think of it as a university course to which I was privileged enough to be uh, let in, and it will be led by Professor Josen of the University of Amsterdam, who is supported by a range of excellent practitioners and technical experts. So please take the time to listen, but also take the time to ask questions, also critical ones, also ones that you, uh, where you say that you doubt the importance of securitization and the use of the instruments, because we want to give you the opportunity to listen, learn and form your own opinion.
I've said before that securitization may be a complex topic, but I don't think it's impossible to wrap our heads around it. It has a, a very simple, it is, a, well, it has a simple use and it is a tool uh, that with the, right, with the right approach will help us manage financial markets. Once you have understanding of what securitization can do and especially what it cannot do, we can also educate, uh, engage in a discussion about the pros and cons. Today, I hope we learn about the different types of securitization and the benefits that they can deliver to economy. Also, I would like to hear and will hear about the EU securitization, uh, the state of the market of, for, in the EU for securitization. And we will have a discussion on STS securitization, simple, transparent and standardized. And that goes a little bit against what I said about complex. These are the fundamentals that we should keep in mind and will help us get through this, uh, this uh, topic. So it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Bart Josen, who will moderate the session. And I wish you a lot of listening pleasure to all the great experts and welcome you once again. Professor Josen, the floor is yours. Many thanks uh, for this uh, nice introduction, uh, Wim. Um, very honorable participants in this uh, educational seminar on understanding securitization, its purpose in the economy and uh, different types of uh, structures. It's my privilege uh, to moderate this uh, session and to ensure that we use the next few hours in the most productive way for you. We have all worked hard to prepare the most informative uh, presentation possible. The securitization markets have uh, been through a turbulent time over the past decade. Certain securitization transactions, especially complex subprime structures with a background in the United States, played an important role in the emergence of the financial crisis in 2007. The problems that arose in the United States then spread to Europe a year later in 2008 and to a lesser extent also to the Asian markets. The very understandable response of European politics in those first years of the financial crisis was to lock the markets. As time went by, it became clear that the European securitizations did not experience the problems of the US subprime market and the realization downed that this type of financing could also play a useful role in the financing of the real economy. As a result, Europe has cautiously opened the door to giving this part of the markets another chance. This caution is accompanied, uh, accompanied by strict rules to prevent us from returning to the traumatizing situation that we experienced in 2008 and later years. European politics has been prudent and cautious. The effects for the markets has been uh, that the revival of the securitization markets has been robust in the US in recent years, but much less so in Europe, as we will discuss later. As far as market participants are concerned, securitization can play an important role in financing Europe's economic growth. In Europe, in uh, recent years, Europe has worked hard to refine the regulatory framework also taking into account the obstacles that could arise in practice. For instance, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, this has led to some midterm corrections to the securitization framework, in particular to stimulate the use of securitization transactions and to optimize support to the corporate sector and the real economy. Steps are also being taken to promote the use of securitization structures for greening of the economy. It is these developments and these points that we will go through with you today. To this end, we have found a group of prominent experts and practitioners willing to put their shoulders to the wheel to deliver this information to you. Before I introduce them, a few practical issues. First, we would like to invite you all to ask questions in between and I will make sure that your questions are answered by one of the panelists. You can put your questions in the Q&A function of this uh, uh, online platform, or you can raise your hand if you want to ask your question directly by unmuting yourselves. A second uh, point is as follows. 
we have limited time for our session and therefore we had to make choices not to cover some of the more technical issues. Thus, we will unfortunately get not get around to the variant of asset based commercial paper securitizations. For this purpose, some background information is included in the annexes to the presentation, which will be made available to you afterwards. Thirdly, halfway the seminar, we will have a short comfort break of about five to ten minutes. Let me now introduce to uh, the speakers. I will do so in the order that they will be speaking. First of all, Mr. William Perrodin, rightly the eminence gris in this field, a ex great expert on the capital adequacy regime for banks and prudential law, former senior officer of uh, the Bank of England and still active in the markets as a prominent advisor from his own niche boutique advisory firm. Next, Steve Gandhi, a senior officer at Grupo Santander, who heads up the securitization practice of this large global bank with its roots in Spain. We are delighted to have Daniela Francovicchio uh, uh, to join our panel. She is the head of securitization, equity investments and guarantees at the European Investment Fund. We have Maria Green, a highly specialized associate from the law, law firm of Ellen Overy, who will share with uh, us her wealth of knowledge on regulatory developments uh, in securitization. And finally, Pablo Portugal is a managing director of AFME. William Peredan will start with an introduction to and discussion of so-called cash securitizations. Steve Candy will elaborate on some concrete practical cases to clarify the objectives of securitization in the economy. Daniela Francovicchio will discuss uh, on balance sheet securitizations and the role of the European Investment Group in providing protection for financing to the real economy. William will then address the state of the securitization markets. And finally, Maria Green, after the break, will take you through some developments in the regulatory sphere. William, you have the floor. Uh, William, you might be on mute. Great. Welcome, everybody. I'm just going to talk for the next 10 minutes, giving you a short introduction about um, what are the main types of securitization, how they work. I think I'd like to I'd like to emphasize to you that securitization is not massively complicated. Um, the, uh, here we go. So I, I've, here I, I've got a slide here that shows, um, shows, if you like, how a securitization is created. And I think that that really makes the whole process tangible. So instead of some complex financial instrument, you just focus on how it's actually done. And so on the left hand side here, you see a bank, possibly a non-bank like a car company, making loans to individuals for mortgages, to buy cars, to do different things, maybe to companies. So that's the traditional bank intermediation or bank uh, lending market. Now, suppose that a bank wants to do a securitization. What does it do? Well, it creates a special purpose entity or spe special purpose vehicle, which you see in the top right hand corner of this picture. And it sells to that special purpose entity a pool of loans, so a portfolio of loans. And the special purpose entity buys the loans with cash. And after that, it is the owner of the loans. They no longer belong to the bank. The entity is independent of the bank. So the loans are fully off balance sheet. And the bank may still run the loans. It may service the loans, 
so that it retains a relationship with the borrower. But the monies will be the coupons, the interest payments and principal repayments will be paid to the special purpose entity. So key question, how does the special purpose entity pay for this? It's acquired this portfolio of loans. How does it pay for it? Well, it issues bonds or notes to investors. And they're sitting down there in the bottom right hand corner of the slide. And so the investors put cash into the special purpose entity, which is then used to reimburse the bank. And the claim that the investors have on the special purpose entity is what we call a securitization. So if you look there in small letters, you'll see that these uh, the securitization, there are different tranches. There's a junior tranche, there would typically be a senior tranche and probably also mezzanine tranches in the middle. And it's important to understand this because those tranches have a structure to them. The senior tranches are always paid first. If there's then enough money to fully repay the senior tranches, that's used for the mezzanine tranches. If there's enough money to pay the mezzanine tranches, the junior tranches are paid. And so different investors can invest in senior, mezzanine or junior, depending on how much they know about the market, how much risk they're willing to take. And so the whole arrangement creates the possibility of customizing claims to people who want, who have more or less expertise, more or less appetite for risk. So on the left hand side, you see a list of the types of loans that are covered or, the, you know, typical loans that are securitized. This is really important and you should really try and grasp this because the key thing is that securitizations are just ways of parceling up cash flows on the underlying loans. If there are problems in securitizations, it almost, almost always is to do with problems in the underlying loans. Subprime was a problem with a subprime market, which then infected securitizations written on subprime. But people who lent subprime directly were also in trouble. The issue is always the underlying loans, or almost always. OK, so I'm, I won't dwell as much on these next couple of these next few slides. So the first slide, really important to get the overall picture. So this the history of it. I mean, it began in the 19th century, the uh, 1920s as well in the US with a series of different financing mechanisms that people use. And then in the 80s, it, it uh, became significant in Europe with RMBS and uh, capital, uh, capital relief transactions in France. And then we've seen um, growth in North America and Europe, and then the spreading out of this type of mechanism or financing approach to other markets. Why securitization? What's the point of this? I mean, as I've described it, I hope you understand it's not very complicated. It's a set of transactions moving claims into a special purpose vehicle and then financing that by issuing those. So why do people do that? Well, one reason is risk transfer. This provides a way in which a bank can create room to do more lending by transferring risk on a pool of well-identified exposures or loans off balance sheet, ultimately owned then through an SPE by investors. The second reason is funding. So particularly early in this market, people were very bothered about funding long dated claims like mortgages and securitization was a very good way of doing that because the, mortgage, the uh, securitization notes had the maturity of the mortgages in effect. So a lot of interest rate risk was removed for banks. And also the banks could tap AAA funding because the senior tranches of the securitization get really high ratings. 
liquidity. So in the crisis, central banks around the world relied heavily on securitization to give assistance to commercial banks. So central banks didn't want to take direct credit risk on banks. They wanted to lend to banks short-term liquidity facilities or short-term financing, but collateralized. So many banks created securitizations in order to be able to pledge the senior bit of that to their central bank to get funding. That was a crucial bit of crisis management in the last few years. Lastly, some borrowers don't have deposits. They're not banks. If you're an, a more, uh, an auto company, what are your? How can you raise money? A good way to raise money is through securitization. So, particularly in Europe, um, Volkswagen, other car companies have made extensive use of securitization as a secured, collateralized form of borrowing from the market. So, the last point I want to make is that. There are three types of securitization. There is what I've so far talked about, which is uh, cash or true sale securitization, where loans are transferred into a special purpose vehicle. The second type of securitization is called synthetic. And synthetic securitization, there isn't um, a transfer of assets or the ownership of the assets or the loans remains with the bank. The bank, in effect, has an, a type of insurance contract with outside investors that they will reimburse the bank depending upon the losses that occur on a well-defined pool of loans. This allows the bank to get insurance and the insurance can be structured with tranches just like in a in a true sale securitization with senior, mezzanine and junior. This is an important market which has grown significantly in the last few years in Europe and is a very important way in which banks can manage the risk on their balance sheets and create room for additional lending. The last type is uh, asset-backed commercial paper and so that is a different kettle of fish in which um, an entity is set up off, off the balance sheet of a bank and itself, in effect, makes loans. So, so these three types of securitization um, all have their particular features. Often, non-specialists regard the synthetic securitizations as somehow more complex than true sale. They're not, from an economic risk point of view, they're pretty much equivalent. From a legal point of view, they're somewhat simpler because there isn't a transferal of assets. Okay, my remaining slides are really just reiterating some of the points I've made. So I don't think I'll dwell on them. I'll let you read them um, you know, after the presentation. But I'm just talking about here the traditional cash securitization. Here is a picture of it again, like uh, similar to what we saw before, special purpose entity investors. Um, the very last slide I have here is just emphasizing the seniority structure. So the notes or bonds issued by the SP, SPV to the investors have senior, mezzanine, junior. The credit quality of those is, is assessed by rating agencies. So that's how they come into this market as the, the um, gatekeepers, if you like, looking at the credit quality of the, of the different tranches. Okay, I'm now gonna hand over to Steve, who is going to describe some actual transactions. Thanks, William. So before we leave this um, slide, I think um, before, and I'll talk to you about some real life uh, transactions. Um, very important to uh, grasp the the seniority point that William was talking about. 
if you look at the yellow arrows next to the the uh, blue column, the blue column is representing as a picture of the securitization split into different tranches. We use the word tranches to mean pieces of the of the of the uh, underlying portfolio, and they range from AAA, which would be the highest rated or the least risky uh, and the highest quality tranche, going down uh, AA, single A, triple B, double B. Which would uh, each of these tranches would have increasing uh, increasingly greater uh, amounts of risk in them. So, and the reason that occurs is because, as indicated by the yellow arrows, the first uh, arrow shows that if there are any losses that occur under on the underlying portfolio of loans, somebody makes a, a fails to pay their their debt and say um, the, the bank has to repossess the, the house and sell the house and perhaps there is a loss. We're not uh, the bank's not able to um, uh, sell the house for a sufficient amount to fully pay off the loan. That kind of loss would then be transferred close to the unrated first loss tranche. And if losses exceed that amount, then it would go to the next tranche, it will be rated and the next tranche, etc. On the um, on the far right, you see the yield and uh, lower yield and higher yield. Because the senior tranche is less risky than, say, the first loss tranche, it obviously um, investors are willing to accept a much lower coupon for the much lower risk that they uh, receive. And likewise, investors that are buying either the unrated first loss tranche or the double B tranches, they will demand a higher coupon for taking higher risk. So this is just a simple illustration. If you, if you understand this concept, then you've really unlocked what securitization is all about. There's the, this is all securitizations share in some way this, this type of feature. So if we go to um, an example, uh, this is a real life example. Um, the previous example talked about mortgages. In this particular case, this is a real life example of an auto loan securitization um, done by a European bank to finance its auto loan portfolio that it originated um, uh, in, in its uh, headquarter country. So you'll see that uh, just like in the previous illustration, I, I'm sorry if the, the picture is a little bit uh, uh, small, you can't see all the, the numbers, but you'll see it in uh, when you get the, uh, the uh, copy. Um, the different columns represent the features of each of these different uh, tranches. So the first one is called class A and the top uh, and then to the right would be class B, class C, etc. Class A is the highest rated um, tranche. In this case, it was rated double A and the tranche to the far right is the riskiest tranche. It's the first loss uh, tranche and uh, each of them have uh, uh, a particular rating assigned to them according to that risk hierarchy that I was describing earlier. As William pointed out, this is an example of a true sale securitization. So the bank has legally transferred the assets over to a special purpose vehicle that was created under the securitization law of the country where this transaction was uh, issued. That legal transfer protects investors against any uh, problems related to the bank. If the bank were to go bankrupt and disappear, I did, um, in, investors would still have a claim on the underlying auto loan portfolio. As William also mentioned, it's a very common feature, 99% of securitizations, I would say, um, uh, are done where the originating bank continues to um, manage the portfolio of loans, uh, the term we use is servicing. What does that mean, servicing? Well, they are the ones that collect the payments from, from clients, and if clients miss a payment, they're the ones that call them to find out what, what the problem is. And if uh, there's a failure to, pay, a failure to pay in a default, they're the ones then would go uh, to try to repossess the car, in this case, to, to pay off the loan.
But all of those activities that they are doing are on behalf of the SPV, which has become the legal owner of the assets. And so all of the payments going into the SPV are used to make payments on these uh, on these tran on these uh, different tranches. The least the the least risky, most senior tranche gets the payments first, so they will their interest payment will be the first to be made. If there's money left over, then the class B would get it. If money's left over, class C, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Likewise, any principal payments usually these structures are uh, would have would feature either what what we call a sequential amortization where. The senior tranche gets all principal payments first, and then the class B would get principal payments, et cetera. In this particular case, the amortization is pro rata, where uh, the, the principal payments are allocated on a pro rata basis according to the different sizes of these different tranches so that they all amortize uh, together. You'll see that the interest rate, when you, when you look at this more closely, You'll see that the interest rates uh, range from, in the case of the trip, uh, the uh, the Class A tranche, it was a, uh, a, a equivalent yield of about 20 basis points over your IBOR, and the first loss tranche had a coupon of uh, something like five and a half percent. So um, you can see that the more risky tranches, investors are willing to buy those, but only if they get compensated on with uh, with higher coupons. It's important to understand, you know, perhaps this is where securitization sometimes gets this uh, concept of complexity. It really isn't complex, as William uh, has said. If you understand the concept of the first in line to get payments is the Class A, and the last in line to get loss losses is the Class A, then you, you can understand that the Class A is the least risky and therefore investors are willing to accept a lower coupon because they have less risk and vice versa on the other side. It's also important to state that you'll see on the bottom right the kinds of investors that came into this particular transaction. Uh, there was a, uh, lot, uh, it was it sold to investors in a wide number of, of uh, countries. I believe in this transaction there was about 25, 30 investors that came into this. And the types of investors that buy these, you can see that there are some bank investors, but also other, the, the orange uh, uh, pie is uh, official institutions, the ECB and other uh, multilateral uh, banks are very large buyers of securitizations. The ECB is a regular buyer of the senior tranches in securitizations as part of their asset back uh, purchase program. Uh, mechanism for transmitting a monetary policy into into uh, Europe, and then there are um, asset managers and and other types of in uh, of investors. Uh, you'll see that they are conspicuous by their absence. That we don't have any insurance company investors in the securitizations. The solvency to uh, risk weights are are extremely punitive for insurance companies, which is unfortunate, and therefore. Um, we, uh, whereas insurance companies used to be very large buyers of, of securitizations, they they have virtually disappeared um, uh, as investors on the asset side uh, of for asset-backed securities. Another a very important uh, feature to point out is that these deals are structured uh, such that the Class A uh, senior tranche in almost all European securitizations are done in such a way that they meet the eligibility criteria of the ECB to um, allow investors to pledge the senior tranche to the ECB to obtain liquidity. So uh, when you mentioned the importance of liquidity, this is uh, an example in point. The, the bank that did this transaction had a dual uh, uh, function. Uh, William pointed out the different uh, reasons why banks uh, do securitizations. This transaction pretty much has all the features that uh, that William mentioned. So in first in um, in the first case, the the bank sold the AAA tranche primarily to finance the auto loan portfolio. Um, the this uh, consumer finance uh, unit. It's a consumer finance unit of a large bank, and 
that consumer finance unit is required to obtain independent funding away from the parent uh, bank. And the securitization market is, is one of the most attractive ways of doing that. So by selling the AAA tranche or the, the senior tranche, I should say, they are obtaining funding, which allows them to finance and, and uh, get the money to make uh, car loans to their customers. Steve, yes. um, can I interrupt you? Um, because yes. that, that it would make sense. There is one question in the in the yes. chat or in the Q and A from yes. uh, Mr. Pennenberg, and I think typically this would be something for William to respond to. And that the question is why uh, Solvency to punish uh, securitizations more. Uh, perhaps one minute, um, uh, William, for uh, as a response to that question. Yeah. So it's just the conservatism of the calibration. So there were there were a whole sequence of calibrations by AOPA, um, and finally there was a with with a, a attempt to get to the bottom of what should be charged in capital terms of securitization for insurers, and um, so they did reduce the conservatism somewhat, and then there was a, a final intervention or you know the commission basically um did a calibration i think itself um and so but the charges remain uh quite conservative it is a quite it's a challenging thing to do calibrations uh in the in the way that people do for solvency too so i wrote a paper five years ago on the the original calibrations, and I've just been working on a new paper on this. You really do have to look at things carefully and in detail to get the data to do a proper calibration. But it's just simply that the numbers remain too conservative. So insurers can take some, they can provide, um, they can invest in synthetic securitizations to some extent if they if they provide credit insurance through the other side of their balance sheet, but uh, on the asset side of their balance sheet, the uh, standardized approach, the, the standardized model calibration is conservative, and it's quite difficult in most countries to get permission to use an internal model. Thanks, uh, thanks, William, for that. Um, <clears throat> and this might be a good bridge, uh, uh, Steve, for you also to. Turn to the next slide yeah, because uh, that is an, another tra uh, transaction. Uh, after that, uh, uh, we will uh, respond to the question of um, Mr. Posius. Um, I would suggest, uh, Bart, if I think what would make sense is if the next two case studies I would um, I would introduce after Daniela's uh, presentation because okay. the next two examples are are synthetic. So yeah. I would. Uh, probably it would make sense to go to Dan Daniela first and then back. Um, but let me finish just one thing on this particular point. So the bank obtained funding by selling the, the senior tranche. It obtained uh, capital relief and risk transfer by selling the more junior tranches by transferring risk to investors. It, uh, provided, it, uh, it uh, provided liquidity, uh, opportunities for liquidity, investors investing in the Class A, especially the bank investors who exclusively invest in the senior tranches, are able to discount their uh, security and raise funds from the ECB. And as noted, as I noted before, uh, while they are part of a large bank group, the, large, the, the bank group imposes a requirement on their finance company unit to obtain independent financing because and because that unit does not raise deposits, it uh, relies on securitization as a very attractive um, financing uh, means. Um, so that's that's uh, that's all I wanted to say about the true sale. And um, shall we answer the question that uh, David Postius uh, raised? Yeah, or perhaps uh, we'll not forget you, uh, Mr. Postius. Uh, but uh, perhaps it would make sense to now switch to uh, Daniela. And then uh, uh, after that, we will find, I think, in the next uh, slot of uh, William, uh, uh, probably makes sense to respond to the question then. So, Daniela, it's uh, it's your turn. The floor is yours, and you have to f switch to. Yeah, it's your slide uh, back. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about the best way to introduce synthetic securitization. What is the easiest way? And normally my best idea comes where when I'm come when I'm on holiday. So in the very last holiday, which unfortunately was before COVID, I was renting a car. So I think everyone is a bit familiar with what uh, with the experience with going and rent a car at the airport. Uh, and the, this came to me as the best example, even if, to be fair, my experience never really like the one that we see in the picture, but it's a little bit more like this when I get to the airport, especially with Ryanair. What it is, um, the first thing when you go to a rental car is they ask you once you have uh, booked your car if you want to pay an additional insurance so they use please if there's any lawyer in the public the use of insurance for as a, as a parallel for um, synthetic securitization is not a legal term so please don't take it as a legal term but the first thing that happens you go to the uh, car drive uh, car uh, rental they ask you if you want to buy the additional insurance this is because traditionally insurance have assessed what is the what is the more likely loss that you can have on a car so they've done a statistical analysis on all the accident and everyone and on all the different places with different car and they've assess that in average there is a 500 500 euro loss on car so normally that's what is the the type of loss coverage that is dedicated to the um, is left to the counterparty to the to you in particular and the insurance is prepared to pay everything any type of loss that is above the specific value um, naturally, when the counterparty asks you, when the rental car asks you if you want to be covered for everything, so also to cover the losses that normally are um, are meant to be covered by you, the cost of that insurance will be higher. So this, for me, is exactly in a general term, is exactly as security, synthetic securitization. You can have a portfolio of loans, of different type of loans, and. I, I think that by now you have understood that securitization is all about boxes, one box uh, on top of the other, and you will see this uh, um, in the next slide. You can have a portfolio of loans, and, and please note that at EIF we mainly work on loans of SME because EIF is the part of the EIB group uh, and is the fund part of the EIB group and is meant to support uh, um, SME in the real economy. So normally when we look at a portfolio um, of synthetic securitization, a portfolio of loans is made by loans to SME. In the same way as for an insurer, you can try to assess out of this portfolio of loan, what is the most likely, the, what is the expected loss in that portfolio? And maybe also a little bit, you can calculate what are the losses of the portfolio. And the principle behind securitization is to be able to split the risk of this portfolio among different investors. So in this case, in, you can see in the picture, we have a junior tranche we will cover the most risky, so the first loss and maybe some more, and then a senior tranche. You can fund investor for both uh, senior and junior. Investor are counterparty that are prepared to receive a payment in exchange for covering the losses uh, um, on the portfolio, on part on the tranche, uh, covering the loss allocated to the tranche of, um, of the securitization. Securitization is all about boxes, and uh, that's where the risk from a portfolio can be transferred in many different ways. It doesn't have to be only a first, lo first loss risk and the second loss risk. It can be done on different tranches, and that's what uh, both Steve and William uh, have mentioned it before. And that's where EIF comes around. So the EIF is a typical investor, the EIB group is a typical investor on the mezzanine tranche. As by emission, EIF cannot take first loss peers, so we cannot take the first losses, the junior tranche, but we can cover mezzanine tranches. Um, therefore, we will be paid um, a fee, and uh, in exchange for the fee, we will um, we will cover for the losses over time on the portfolio. So 
this is for me ABC of securitization. This is what it is. The complex part, because in reality we always say it's not complex, but there is a complex part. But I like for everything, the complex part is in the ability of assessing the different levels. So where the junior tranche ends, where the mezzanine tranche ends, and what is the appropriate remuneration, and what is the estimate of the loss on each single tranche because as an investor that's what you really want to know what what uh, is the um, potential loss that you have uh, in your tranche in our case in our mezzanine which is translating is what is the potential loss that can occur in the portfolio which is higher than 1 million in this picture and it goes between 1 million and 3 million what is the likelihood of having that loss uh, from the bank that keeps the portfolio on its balance sheet so as we was said early on the synthetic transaction does not include any transfer of assets so the assets the loan uh, on the left are still in the balance sheet of the um, of the counterparty for the for the bank in general for the bank the advantage is sharing part of the risk on the portfolio passing part of the risk of the losses on the portfolio to third party so as I say, the main the boxes, as we mentioned before, always boxes. The most important and maybe the most difficult part is assessing the losses on the portfolio. We're talking now in this case, I'm talking about a portfolio of a loan to, to SME, which is my bread and butter. Um, to assess the portfolio of, the, of, of loans, you will naturally will need to know what are the probability of default of every single loan, so every single SME behind, so what is the probability of them going into default? And this is the data that each bank owns because they have to assess this probability of default themselves. And what is the possibility of recovery once there is a default to how much you will be able to recover. There are naturally other elements to consider like correlation between the different industry and etc. But these two are the main one. By knowing the probability of default and by knowing the amount that you can recover in case of default, then you can estimate the losses. And the losses, and these, uh, you will always think about, they come from the bottom. So the losses will a road your tranche coming from the model first the junior tranche then the mezzanine and then the senior um a, a bank that has this portfolio by the way if you want to ask question please feel free if i go too fast or if you if i skip any point that is relevant for you um the a bank that owns the portfolio the portfolio in black is obliged, is forced by the co obliged to keep some capital on the side. Um, the bank, naturally, because he knows very well the portfolio, will be able to assess the far part, which is the real expected loss, because they know uh, the probability they have provided, they have calculated themselves what is the probability of default and the recovery. So they will be able to assess what is the expected loss for the tranche and normally for the portfolio, sorry. And normally they will have to put provision on the side in order to cover for the loss that they know they will incur into. At the same time, the regulator asking for additional capital to cover the unexpected loss. So to cover variation for what can happen over time or for uh, the model being uh, slightly off or changes that can happen um, in general in the market. Therefore, the interest of the bank is in order to reduce these black, these red blocks, red box of capital allocated is or partially reduced more likely is to share some of the risk in the portfolio and the risk is shared by offering different tranches of risk to investors. EIF, as before, will be in the junior, in the mezzanine tranche, EIF and the EIBA group. And the beauty of participating with EIF, which, by the way, provides financial guarantee and not insurance, just for the lawyer, um, is that the EIF um, is a multilateral development bank. Therefore, everything that has been guaranteed by EIF um, will consent to the originator to put zero capital on the side. So the originator will benefit by guarantee on the side because EI, by guarantee by EIF because EIF is meant to be there forever and being able to repay uh, the losses on the portfolio under um, uh, forever. So my next slide would just want to show you very quickly 
what is the calculation behind it? Why, why, why is actually a beneficial element to enter into securitization for the counterparty for the bank having the portfolio? So on the left, we have this usual boxes of the portfolio. On the right, the structure that by now, by now we more or less know, a junior tranche, a mezzanine tranche, and in this case, a senior tranche. Um, this standard st structure is the one that uh, EIF and EIB have been using a lot, have been mainly used in the last two years, um, deploying the Juncker plant funds. And uh, um, in particular, last, in the last two years, we deployed two billion of Juncker plants funds that were reallocated by EIB to cover, to, allow, to support the COVID affected SME using this type of structure. So being in the mezzanine, and um, being a mezzanine and cover the losses on the mezzanine. So from the point of view of the bank, the bank has a portfolio before. So in this case, 1 billion 226 before. Um, it, the calcul is, all calculations are very simplified. So just take it as an example of the process behind. Before the securitization, the bank will have to put on the side regulatory capital, which is uh, calculated as the capital ratio multiplied by the riskiness of the portfolio, the RW uh, density. And the capital allocated in this case will be 83 million. So by multiplying by the size of the, uh, of the portfolio. On the other side, and it's where the, the side of the securitization, after having done the securitization, the bank, the originator will held the senior tranche, the 1 billion, and the junior tranche, while the mezzanine is placed with the EIB group. Um, the capital allocated to the senior tranche, there are different formula, but for simplicity, we use the basic of 15%. There are different regulatory formula to calculate that. The mezzanine is guaranteed by EIF, and therefore, once you have a guarantee by EIB group, you can put zero as capital. And, and that's the benefit of having an unfunded guarantee. By the way, you can still have zero if you have a guarantee provided by third party, which is collateralized by cash. Uh, getting back, the junior tranche is obviously retained by the originator and is covering the expected loss and even more, and it obviously will have one-to-one -one retention. So now if you make it a calculation and calculate what is the actual capital allocated, you end up with a number, 15.7 plus 26, and then you end up, if you subtract by 83.7, you subtract the, the two capital allocated on junior and senior tranche, then you have the amount of capital that is, re is released. This is a very simplified calculation and clearly does not take into account any additional um, cost that may be involved because when one bank decides if entering into the transaction or not, obviously the cost is also a relevant element. So how much capital you can release for what cost. Um, what I wanted to show is that the synthetic securitization is simply a way, an appropriate and efficient way to manage the risk on the portfolio by transferring part of it to third parties, the third party investors that are normally um, professional investor that knows how the market works. And there are way, it's a way to manage the capital or raise capital. Alternative to this to synthetic securitization are um, equity funds or uh, equity raising or um, or tier one capital ratio, but all of the tier one capital raising, all of them have different costs. So those are in general, the two instruments that might be used for a comparison of, of the cost of release of capital. I yeah, can, we, can, can we proceed with uh, your last slide and then? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, so I'm gonna leave the excess spread to, uh, to uh, well, I, uh, okay, I'll, I'll proceed with the last slide because if it, and maybe um, afterwards Steve can uh, explain what is an additional feature that is provided by securitization, which is the excess spread. So on synthetic securitization, we why is a B participating to the group? And here you have it, the normal boxes with a normal structure that we have learned up until now. The EIF then provide a counter guarantee to the EIB group, or the EIB group provide a counter guarantee and then, and that's where the part is impo the important part, uh, and why the EIB group participate to securitization. The EIB has uh, 
enter into an agreement with the bank, with the originator, committing to, and the bank will commit to originate a new portfolio of loans. Because of the benefit that they got from the release of capital, the bank will commit to use part of the capital release of all the capital release in an origination of the new portfolio of loans at a discounted price. Therefore, the, the all circle turnarounds, we, by, by the use of any, a financial instrument, we support, we help the bank to release capital, and the bank in exchange will commit to keep on originating lending or using that capital for new lending to SME at a specific rating, maybe at an advantageous rating to the SME. Um, and that's a very powerful tool and it's been working for us for a long time under the Juncker plan and under the EIF process in general. The, under the EIF business model in general. The fundamental element is that now we have been able to deploy and use our business model also to support the new ESG market and to support the, the direction that the investment bank and fund have decided to take. So ask the counterparty to commit to originate in a portfolio with specific characteristic and in particularly with green characteristic on the on the green market or the social market as well because we are also very active in the market so that we can incentivize bank to finally enter in the market that will allow maybe in the future to have a, a big portfolio of green loan that can be resecured resecured in the future so the whole purpose of EIF, EIF B Group is support the real economy, support the real economy in the green transformation, and we use securitization to incentivize bank to do so. Thanks, uh, Daniela. Yeah, and um, um, uh, uh, Steve will um, also show us a real uh, life example of uh, such a, a transaction. So, yep. Thank you very much. Um, so if you um, have followed um, uh, Daniela's explanation, uh, it will give you an idea of, okay, let me find the, let me find the. Uh, you have example. to go back. No, I, I uh, there was one, that's the one I was looking for. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So um, here's an example of a, a uh, synthetic securitization very much along the lines of what Daniela has just explained. A bank um, uh, entered into an agreement with the EIF, EIB, uh, to provide credit protection on a portfolio of SME leases originated by the bank. You'll see that it's denominated in, in Zloty. The, uh, the bank in question was a uh, bank in, in Poland. And they had a portfolio of, of leases, equipment leases to uh, corporate uh, SME clients. And we entered into, well, the, the bank entered into an agreement um, to provide protection on the senior tranche and the mezzanine tranche. You remember Daniela's explanation of first loss mezzanine and, and uh, senior tranche. In this case, the IAF agreed to provide protection on the uh, uh, senior tranche as well as the mezzanine tranche and the bank retained the first loss uh, deductible like uh, using uh, Daniela's rental car uh, equivalent uh, explanation. And the just as uh, Daniela explained, um, the bank in question agreed to redeploy the freed up capital from releasing the capital on the senior tranche and the mezzanine tranche into additional lending to support their SME uh, clients. Another feature of this transaction, which uh, uh, Daniela touched on, but we didn't want to go into too much detail, was that, that uh, this transaction featured the use of, of what's called synthetic excess spread. That is, a portion of the, um, the interest payments that uh, we receive on the underlying portfolio can be allocated uh, into the structure to provide uh, coverage of the first loss in addition to the first loss tranche. It's another feature that adds uh, some a very a nice efficiency factor to this transaction, lowers the cost of the transaction to us, reduces the size of the, of the first loss tranche that's required to be held by the bank, and 
capital is is held is uh, calculated on that excess spread in accordance with current ECB uh, guidance that has been given to European banks about how to calculate uh, capital. I, I make this point. I don't want to go into too much detail, but to say that um, the one of the reviews that we, we are currently expecting EBA RTS on uh, potential changes to the way the, the capital would have to be allocated to synthetic excess spread. And we're very concerned as a market that uh, this be done in um, in a way that does not kill the economics of these transactions because um, the, the, the amount of capital we would have to hold against the synthetic excess spread could basically uh, change the economics and make a, a transaction of this sort unviable. So we're hopeful that um, uh, the guidance will come out in, in accordance with our current uh, ECB uh, guidance that, we're, that we've been using for a couple of years. But here's an example of a synthetic transaction. You remember what I said earlier, if you understand the tranching, if you understand that senior tranche is the least risky, then the next riskiest, and then the, the most risky, you are understanding the basics of securitization. And uh, the capital benefits, I hope, are have become very clear uh, by transferring a portion of the risk of this portfolio to a third party. We are able to free up capital to provide more lending uh, to support the real economy. So that's an example of a transaction very similar to what Daniela was uh, talking about. And I'm going to uh, go back to the previous. Uh, there was another uh, case study that I wanted to uh, go into that just uh, briefly has yeah, Steve and, uh, and yeah. then we can go to uh, yep. the market uh, presentation. Yeah. Yes, um, and I should say that this synthetic securitization, this goes uh, Bart to answer David Postios's question yeah. about yeah. the use of, about the use of, of synthetic securitization. Uh, Fannie Mae, Ginny Mae, Freddie Mac, the government's large government sponsored entities that provide mortgage guarantees to American banks regularly use this um, this synthetic uh, structure to uh, transfer the risk of their guaranteed portfolio to institutional investors. I think they've done about five or six trillion uh, of notional value of, of mortgage assets in the US using this particular structure. So it's 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 being used by by uh, uh, government sponsored entities. Just very briefly, this is an example uh, of a, another synthetic securitization that we that was done with that has a green feature. The underlying portfolio is a project finance portfolio origin, uh, issued originated by a bank and uh, over half of the projects that are being financed by this portfolio are for renewable projects, wind farms, solar farms, etc. And this transaction was done on a synthetic basis where we transferred the uh, mezzanine uh, tranche and the first loss tranche to an institutional investor that had a particular mandate to promote and encourage um, green and other ESG uh, lending. So this transaction bought protection on the mezzanine and first loss tranche for this portfolio of project finance loans and the bank undertook to um, replenish the deal with renewable energy projects and we the bank also committed to increase their lending to uh, green projects as measured by megawatt uh, uh, megawatt uh, power uh, uh, megawatt energy that was uh, that was uh, provided on a green basis, and if the bank met those requirements, then the coupon on the credit protection would would uh, decrease. So here's an example of how a very very powerful tool that securitization can have uh, in support of the uh, green and ESG agenda. So I'll stop. There was, there was, yeah, and there was one uh, more question, and then we uh, uh, give the floor to William. Uh, um, would you happen to know why um, 
uh, German law was applied in this Polish uh, transaction, whereas the assets were located in 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 uh, Poland, or is that a, d a detail that uh, that we should? Um, that that question should be directed to Daniela. <laughs> no, yes, but it, that's a good question. But it, it was not a requirement from EIF for sure because EIF require it doesn't. Um, we well, we used to use English law. Now we prefer Luxembourgish law only because it's a standard for us. But I think it, when you switch to a different uh, law, like in this case, normally it's a request from the counterparty from the bank. So maybe it was a bank that had already, uh, or was a counterparty that had already, as, as maybe had a basis in different country, not only in Poland, but is more likely was. Uh, the, the mother counterparty of that bank was in a different country, and that's why they prefer to have the language in German, the the law in German, as the law of the as the jurisdiction where the mother counterparty is. Right, and let's, it is let's quite just... common to use um, different laws. Um, yeah, Spanish law, Portuguese, Italian. It depends on uh, the the location of the, the the various parties, right? William, shall we go to uh, the the overview of the market um, as uh, you will be presenting? But before we do that, there is one more question, which I thought was um, uh, very um, uh, in your uh, line of expertise, and yeah, that is yeah. the question of uh, Mr. Penenberg had uh, whether or not um, securitization are more or less economically interesting in a low for long interest environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, in the current market, banks are, have plenty of funding. So there isn't really a lack of funding because of all the central bank funding. Um, so, so I think that, uh, you know, as I mentioned in it with the earlier slide, there are different motives for securitization, some of which will be more important at different um, uh, points in time. And um, so, you know, risk transfer is probably relatively important right now with people being constrained, wanting to do more lending, but being constrained in what they can do. Um, and securitization as a source of funding may be less important for banks, but still very important for auto companies. And there's still obviously benefits from having a, a source of secured funding, which can be priced at, say, uh, most of it being priced at a AAA level. So it's all relative. I just pick up on David's earlier question about, you know, comparing the ECB with the ECB's intervention in securitization with uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, those institutions are buying mortgages and then issuing securitizations or risk transfers. So they're sort of very different because the ECB is operating, I mean, mostly in the secondary market, I guess, sometimes in the primary market, but it's not, it's an investor, it's not the person, the legal person issuing the securitization. But it's very interesting to see all of these official participations in securitization. So with the Juncker plan being running off the securitization model, basically, the American agencies using securitization. Um, there is actually now the beginnings of the securitization market for, um, for multilaterals, multilateral development banks. So all of these are ways in which the public sector is using the basic techniques of securitization and so using ideas that have been that have come out of the private markets uh, but using it for their own purposes okay yeah. shall we so go to the market of a few yeah let me just go on to that Okay, so just just got a couple of slides here to talk about the performance of the of the European market. So um, it, you know through the crisis um, of 2008, 2007 to 10, the European market was relatively unaffected, and then some weaknesses began to appear after that, particularly in the valuation of Securitization. So the the discounts that you saw in the American market 
in the trading, in the prices as they were kind of traded in the market, began to hit the European market. But in the underlying credit performance, you know, whether things defaulted or not, there was very little movement. And so for the AAA, securitized, the AAA rated securitizations in Europe, there were basically negligible defaults. And it's important, as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to understand that when you look at a securitization, you're really looking at some claim on the underlying loans, the underlying assets. So when there's a problem, it's typically related and should be understood by thinking about what's going on in the underlying assets. So breaking what happened down in Europe across asset classes, you see that there are really only three places where there was any uh, delinquencies in the European market. There, was, uh, there were CDO squares where people had issued securitizations and the pools involved tranches of other securitization. Actually, I looked at some European deals on that a couple of years ago, and the ones that had real problems, actually, they had American underlying um, securitization tranches in them, in the ones I looked at. So even the European deals of that type were being affected by um, the fact that in their pools they bought things that were have American subprime exposure. The second significant area where there were some defaults was in um, commercial real estate. Commercial real estate is a very particular asset class where um, typically, you know, the loans are made and if the if they have to be, I mean, if the securitization ends at a point in a crisis, typically the, the loans have to be refinanced. So there's a refinancing risk, which you don't get on a mortgage. A mortgage, when, um, you know, if securitization will exist and then if a pool of mortgages, all the mortgages will have amortized by the time you get to the end of the structure. So there isn't a need to refinance the underlying mortgages. So some asset classes that have this feature that they that they they need to be refinanced when securitization sort of comes to an end, those are a significant, those can be a significant um, source of issues. Leaving those aside and you know these things that were exposed to the American market. Um, there were a few mezzanine tranches of um, leveraged loan CLOs. So really, the, overall, the European market was pretty bulletproof, and um, you know what it said on the can actually happened. And what what we're now seeing, I mean, we now have the benefit of an additional stress event, if you like, which is the 2020 event, and. Here, some interesting things. Firstly, again, the European market was kind of bulletproof uh, from a pure credit perspective. In the um, the default rates, hardly, uh, I mean, didn't pick up at all. Um, the you know, well below the long run average for single year data, and um, the. The downgrade rate um, increased slightly, but again, it's well below the one-year average. So basically, the the market was very robust. It's sort of interesting to look at these numbers. This table is maybe difficult for you to read, but there is one row. If you see the few defaults that there were out of this market, were thousands of thousands of tranches. The the handful of defaults that there were, there were again a few. European CMBS. Now, that's sort of interesting. I don't think it's a liquidity effect. It's just that in that crisis, everybody's worried about buildings because, you know, are people going to reoccupy buildings in the same way? So what I'm basically pointing you to is that when you understand this market, you have to think of it in terms of the underlying, the underlying assets. It's not that somehow the 
technology itself introduces substantial new risks. It's that there's an exposure to underlying assets. So I'm just going to go on now. The second big point I was going to make is a comparison of volumes over time. And here you see a comparison of, of, the, of the US and the, um, and the European markets. And this is something that obviously people in the market are very aware of and bothered about. Um, but it's sort of important to understand that, that since the crisis, um, you know, the American market has fully recovered and expanded, and the European market really hasn't. So we've been, so we've had very low volumes, um, low volumes compared with the pre-2007 years, but also really low volumes compared with the US. So here is, uh, this shows you um, just some slightly more detailed figures. Here you can see um, a distinction between, these are the placed amounts, so the amounts that are not, um, that are not, uh, you know, retained because typically they're going to be pledged to central banks, so the amounts that are actually issued to investors. And you can see the ratio of retained has been really high. So even though there were some years in which there seemed to be a reasonable volume, there wasn't a volume that was actually being placed with investors. Most of it was being uh, retained. And that was driven by this need that banks had, encouraged by the central banks, to create collateral that could be used in difficult times to pledge to the central bank to get assistance. So, um, so this slide is just shows you the beginnings of this emerging market in ESG securitizations. So top left, you see some different asset classes, um, residential mortgages, commercial mortgage, uh, asset back commercial paper, and then some synthetic um, on balance sheet ABSs. And then at the top right, you see a breakdown by country, but uh, leaving out the UK, you've got France, Netherlands, Portugal, Italy. And um, and then I've just got a, something blocking here. Um, and then um, you see the asset class over time a bit in the bottom right. So what is the significance of this? I mean, this is a, 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 a new market, really. I mean, um, there's a, quite a lot of activity this year, as you might imagine, because uh, green and ESG um, issues are, are, are massively important in the eyes of investors and hence the originators are now thinking about how can they possibly rise to this uh, this challenge from from the investor side and securitization is a really interesting uh, vehicle for incentivizing banks because it provides i mean in general a bank it's going to be very difficult to give banks incentives to do green things or esg things through their deposit interest rates, I mean, encouraging individuals to receive a lower interest rate, um, with the bank then saying it will put money into into um, uh, into green or ESG lending is going to be difficult. But with capital markets fundraising of the sort that securitization offers, it's quite straightforward to start putting in requirements that the bank um, either be devoting this to green assets or that it commit um, to use proceeds on subsequent green lending. So this is a very interesting area that of course the industry and uh, regulators as well are really focused on right now. <laughs> 
Thanks, and um, indeed, uh, the, 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 the slide shows us basically the early stages of development of this market, and we all hope that that market is going to be increasing, increasing, and to be more important. Uh, what I would like now to propose, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are a couple of a handful of questions in the in the Q and A. You will not be forgotten, but um, uh, I propose to um, to because typically these are also questions that might be very suitable for Maria uh, in her presentation to uh, to deal with. Um, I would like to propose a, a short break of uh, let's say seven minutes until uh, 12 30 on uh, the on the computer clock CET that is and then we reconvene um, and perhaps Maria would then be so kind to quickly go through the two questions that are in the in the in the in the chat box so we will uh, return to you at uh, 12 30. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, um, being um, at, uh, at the time that we would reconvene, uh, Maria, may I just suggest that you respond to the question on the EBA uh, significant risk transfer um, uh, document and that the other two questions we would try to deal with them after your uh, introduction of the regulatory framework. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, so, so just looking at the question. So the question about the IBA SIT significant risk transfer guide um, on synthetic excess spread calculation binding, where the SIT is just achieved if that guide is met. Um, so the SIT is a bit uh, unfinished um, kind of area because various guidance, draft guidance have been evolving for some time, but it, it's not really binding, it's not really applicable yet as a matter of law. And we are expecting as part of the wide review of the prudential regime of how securitizations are treated, the significant risk transfer piece to be kind of more fully addressed and completed and finally translated into the legislation, the changes to the legislation. Until that happens, the way it plays out in practice kind of really depends on the national regulator and how the relevant bank is supervised. And it is indeed the case, as already alluded in that question, that uh, the significant banks that are supervised by the European Central Bank um, will need to, if they are seeking to achieve significant risk transfer on their transactions, kind of start the conversations in early stages of the deal with the European Central Bank and their national supervisor as well, in order to kind Kind of get clearance, kind of confirm that the deal is being done uh, and the regulator is happy with how it is being done. Therefore, it's really, it does come down a lot to bilateral conversations between the relevant um, banks and their supervisors. So at the moment, unfortunately, we are still in this kind of interim uh, kind of transitional period where we don't quite yet have all the final pieces of legislation in place and instead we have what is essentially is non-binding uh, guidance. I don't know, Steve, if you want to add anything to that answer. Or perhaps you could continue with uh, your presentation and that we try to catch up basically on the other questions uh, afterwards, uh, yeah. afterwards. Yeah, let's okay, uh, do it like that. OK, let's turn our minds to the exciting world, um, world of the securization uh, regulation, which has been evolving for quite a number of years. So on this first slide, what I wanted to do is just to give you a bit of a flavor of how in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis, um, the concerns that were raised in connection with securitization um, were addressed by numerous regulatory reforms and initiatives. So let's just take some of the kind of uh, very kind of bright examples of how this was dealt with. So risk retention regime. It was introduced to ensure that there is an alignment of interests between originators, sponsors of securitizations, that is parties behind the deal, parties the ones who are doing the transaction, and investors. And that those originators and sponsors have a skin in the game. They also have something to lose if transaction suffers losses because assets do not perform well. So 
the rules were first introduced um, as a restriction on certain types of EU institutional investors. And the rules were first introduced back in 2011 and were evolving for more and more different types of investors over time. So what does it mean, restriction on investor? So what it means is that relevant regulated EU investors like EU regulated banks, certain regulated fund entities, uh, insurance entities, if they want to invest in a securitization anywhere in the world, they could only invest, they can only invest, if they confirm that the securitization complies with the EU risk retention rules. And that the originator sponsor of that transaction, which may come from any jurisdiction in the world, has agreed, undertaken and disclosed, and on an ongoing basis confirms that it complies with the retention rules and retains at least 5% of material net economic interest in the transaction using one of the permitted risk retention options as prescribed by the relevant EU legislation. And in 2019, with the introduction of the EU securitization regulation regime, the risk retention rules were expanded even further, and we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail in a minute when we start focusing a bit more specifically on securitization regulation regime. So the next kind of theme is that certain securitization products were seen just too opaque, too, comple too complex. They perform badly. Examples are resecurization, CDOs, where basically securitization was done on top of another securitization and so forth. So those were like uh, really kind of the, the bad, bad, toxic kind of products that were seen. So the way the regulation dealt with this kind of part of the market is first, capital charge was introduced through the regulation of banks, which essentially made this product very unattractive and economic uh, to carry on uh, doing or holding positions in those type of products. And subsequently, with the introduction of the securitization regulation regime, there was introduced an outright ban on those type of products. The other theme was that um, to do with credit rating agencies. So it's normal and common practice in securitization and continues to this day for parties structuring the deal to pay the rating agencies to rate the transaction. So this practice, so-called issue pays model, was perceived to give rise to conflicts of interest. And this was addressed via amendments to the credit rating agency regulation. In particular, um, the changes were introduced so that all securitizations, if rated, are required to have at least two ratings from different rating agencies regulated in the EU, and also were required on top of it consider the appointment of a small rating agency with less than 10% market share. So what it evolved into in the last uh, few years is that um, we now have seen new um, small rating agencies coming into the market to rate securitizations, and we see them very commonly being engaged on securitizations uh, to rate uh, transactions. So this is kind of becoming quite a kind of common feature on transactions. Um, apologies, I need to do, <laughs> I need to cough, so I'll just quickly put myself on mute. So the next topic is um, transparency and reporting. So there was a fair amount of criticism about the fact that there wasn't a consistent approach to how much transparency reporting was given on transactions. So, and if you have heard um, in earlier, as you heard in the earlier uh, of this presentation, uh, the liquidity, a uh, use of securitizations for liquidity purposes as eligible collateral in central bank liquidity operations is a pretty big part of why securitizations are kind of are being used. So on the transparency reporting, the European Central Bank and the Bank of in England led the way in introducing reforms on transparency requirements for securitizations, providing kind of more detail on what and how things need to be disclosed, including introduction of specifically designed templates for the disclosure on the underlying assets. So these central bank kind of initiatives were subsequently followed by changes made via credit rating agency regulation that introduced kind of separate requirements on disclosure and reporting for certain types of securitizations, uh, 
technical standards were developed with templates for certain types of uh, reporting on the underlying assets. And although this regime wasn't really fully implemented, this was mainly because it was kind of taken over by the securization regulation and the wider kind of requirements introduced under the securization regulation on transparency reporting. And we'll talk about it in a bit more detail in a minute. So the next big topic was the fact that um, there was a need um, to try and distinguish between what is essentially high quality securization that would help to better differentiate between high quality securizations that are more simple, more stand standardized, and the rest of the securization market. So the securization industry itself actually led this initiative by setting up Prime Culturalized Securities, PCS, which is a not-for-profit initiative that essentially introduced what's called PCS label and a set of criteria that the securization that wanted to receive this PCS label had to satisfy. And it must be said that in fact, the PCS label criteria is not that dissimilar to, to what essentially later became STS regime. And we'll talk about it uh, in a bit more detail kind of later. And PCS itself these days is authorized as STS verification agents as well under the securization regulation regime. So this initiative kind of carries on and it wasn't in vain, it actually paved and created great foundation for moving on to this kind of uh, regime for high quality securizations. So other initiatives on high quality securizations um, were introduced under liquidity coverage ratio regime, where a new set of criteria was introduced for certain types of securizations. If satisfied, they would essentially be eligible level 2B assets. And similarly, under Solvency 2, uh, another similar to LCR, but not exactly the same, but quite similar set of eligibility criteria for high quality securization was also introduced for Solvency 2 type um, 1 securizations. And finally, in 2019, with the introduction of the securization regulation, we have our own STS regime that kind of harmonized uh, what was, for example, in LCI and, uh, and Solvency 2, but uh, with additional um, things to add it to. And we'll talk about it in a bit more detail as well. So the other big piece was prudential framework, how for prudential purposes, securizations are treated. And by this, we mean primarily regulatory capital treatment of securizations. And that was further strengthened with um, implementation of the Basel, revised Basel securization framework, including um, kind of different treatment for STS securizations. However, this is not, these are not the only topics. In fact, as you can see from this slide, the reforms that um, and changes, regulatory changes that affected securizations were pretty vast and came from lots and lots of different areas. And some affected uh, and created, um, gave rise to considerations on to sell side parties, i.e. the um, originators, sponsors of the transactions, and others were aimed at by side parties. By that we mean investors. So this slide provides a high level of overview. I do not propose to go into every single kind of bit highlighted in it, but maybe I'll pick up one other theme from this particular slide. So securizations are in general marketed to professional institutional investors only and are not really suitable for retail investors. So the regulatory reforms, in particular PREPS regime and new restriction in securization regulation address this point as well and put safeguards in place, meaning that so that securizations cannot easily be sold to retail investors. And there is a bit more detail on various uh, reg reforms um, mentioned on this slide in the back of the annex to the slides. But let's move on now to the securization regulation regime itself. So with the fact from 2019, from the beginning of 2019, we have securization regulation regime in place. And sometimes it's referred as STS regulation, but in fact, it's much more than STS. Securization regulation regime can be broadly broken into six parts. So what it's done, it created a recast 
regime for risk retention. Because as I mentioned before, we have had risk retention regime in the EU since 2011, prescribing different rules for different types of investors. They were broadly very, very similar, but there were some differences. So as far as risk retention rules for investors are concerned, all of that became harmonized under the securitization regulation regime. And in addition, it introduced for the first time in Europe, a direct requirement for EU originator, EU sponsor of the transaction to undertake to comply with risk retention. So before it always applied indirectly as a restriction on investors, so investor couldn't buy the deal if situation didn't comply with risk retention. And that continues to be the case. On top of it, we now also have um, direct requirement for EU originators and sponsors to also be themselves directly liable for compliance with risk retention. And as part of the capital market recovery package in April this year, we also saw changes being introduced so that um, risk retention regime is better calibrated and adjusted for securitizations of non-performing loans. And this was introduced in order to drive and help with the post-pandemic uh, economic recovery. So the next big part of the securitization regulation regime is um, investor due diligence requirements. But before we turn to that, let's talk a little bit uh, about the transparency because they kind of have implication for what we're going to talk about uh, due diligence for investors. So transparency, as I said before, is a pretty big piece, has been for some time since um, the aftermath of the financial crisis. And whilst we had different initiatives and we had LCR, we had Solvency 2, we had PCS label. So the situation regulation essentially brought various streams together into the much more comprehensive transparency requirements that prescribe template-based disclosure uh, and reporting for um, on the underlying assets and it's loan by loan which means if you have a portfolio of millions of loans you're going to have loan by loan reporting on every one of those underlying um, assets. And for these purposes, we are focusing on non-ABCP, on more kind of traditional securitizations, because the rules for ABCP on transparency are a little bit different. So on top of the templates that need to be completed on at least quarterly basis, loan by loan, on underlying assets, there are prescribed templates for investor reporting. Uh, there are also requirements for disclosure of all core transaction documents. There are also requirements to provide ad hoc disclosure from time to time disclosure when there are material changes that are happening on the transaction and for transactions that are deemed public. And for these purposes, we are talking about securitizations with admission to trading on a regulated market uh, in Europe where prospectus regulation rules apply. Those transactions are considered public and therefore when they comply with transparency requirements, they have to comply by making all of the reporting, all of the information that must be disclosed via an authorized situation repository in the EU. And we now have two authorized repositories in the EU that uh, ISMA uh, kind of regulates. So this regime is kind of very prescriptive. It's very, very comprehensive. There are lots of kind of parts to it. So the next big bit is the investor due diligence requirements. So investor due diligence requirements essentially tell you that if you're a relevant institutional investor, and this regime now broadens the net of what kind of institutional investor is caught. So if before discussion regulation, it was primarily certain regulated funds under FMD regime, um, great institutions, investment firms, and solvency two farms. Now it's been extended beyond that. Now we have UCITS investors court, certain regulated pension investors court as well. So these institution investors cannot invest in the securitization unless they essentially do their homework and they comply with um, certain items. They verify a compliance with certain items, including risk retention, that there is sufficient proper transparency and disclosure provided, that credit and gratitude standards are met so that the loans are originated in a well and sound kind of um, a criteria being applicable to that rather than just underwritten very, very badly. And then on an ongoing basis, the investors are supposed to monitor compliance uh, with the due diligence and the performance of the underlying assets and what's happening with the transaction. So the due diligence themselves kind of fairly prescriptive and um, it's quite comprehensive kind of part of the 
uh, kind of regulatory framework that is securitization regulation. So separately, there is a segment of the regulation that talks about credit granting requirements. And it's all to do with how the originator, sponsor original lender, essentially where the loans are coming from, how have they been created? And in the aftermath of the um, uh, pandemic under the capital markets recovery package, these credit granting standards have been further uh, kind of amended to uh, kind of better accommodate uh, non-performing loan securitizations. And these credit granting standards, for example, the one thing that they put a stop to is the um, um, self-certified loans, which is basically where some of the subprime crisis in the US was coming from, where essentially basically people were taking self-certification by the underlying borrowers at the face value rather than doing proper checks and underwriting, creating loans properly with proper diligence and proper suitability tests. So this is also very much part of the securitization framework. So also there are various restrictions and prohibitions that's a part of the security regulation framework as well. For example, there is um, a restriction on adverse selection. So you don't want basically have cherry picking going on there without proper disclosure. So you don't want the very toxic, badly performing loans being sold um, and with the risk transfer to the investor without proper disclosure being kind of provided around it. There is, this, like as I alluded before, there's a ban on certain type of um, securitizations called re-securitization. Um, there is um, no self-certified residential loans kind of restriction, which is part of the credit granting standards. There's restriction on non-sale to retail clients. And there's restriction on ability to set up special purpose vehicles, the issuing kind of vehicles in certain third country jurisdictions where it concerns um, certain anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing, and certain avoidance of tax, uh, kind of bad, uh, good tax governance kind of regime. So there are restrictions there as well. And finally, the very big piece of the discussion regulation regime is the STS, the simple, transparent, standardized securitization framework, which first was introduced for cash traditional securitizations only and again as part of the capital market recovery package from April this year we now have on balance sheet synthetic securitization regime as well just one thing to note it's optional regime it's not mandatory and it's very commonly now used on all consumer assets securitizations in particular involving residential mortgages auto assets uh, consumer loans credit cards and trade receivables um, it's a self-attestation regime because this is basically where your originator sponsor is going to be doing the assessment and then deciding whether or not they want to designate their securitization as STS. And there Aria? is a very, yes. Yeah. Aria, one more minute. Yeah. And then we have two or three sure. questions uh, that um, we would like to address before we end at uh, one o'clock. Sure. Um, so the STS criteria, the foundation criteria, essentially what forms the basis for what you need to meet to in order to be able to designate your transactions as STS, is pretty comprehensive and it builds on best practices around what is simple, transparent and standardized and introduces additional disclosure, additional transparency. This slide gives you a quick summary and probably fair to say that EU really led the way with, de with developing the STS framework, which essentially then got adopted and implemented um, internationally via Basel and in the EU as our EU STS regime. But the EU STS, uh, in the first instance, satisfying foundation criteria is just part of the story because then each of the other regulatory frameworks that then recognizes, okay, if you're STS, here is better, more flexible um, regulatory treatment because you're STS. So the uh, kind of additional kind of different the way uh, STS are treated under LCR or CR or Solvency 2 or EMIR, they all come with additional uh, criteria that must be satisfied on top of the STS foundation criteria. And this is where also fair to say that the way traditional synthetic situations, kind of the way they're treated for these purposes is going to be a bit different. So just appreciate that STS kind of world is fairly complex. There are lots of parts to it. Um, but Discretion regulation, even though we've been living with it for the last three years, it's not exactly a complete piece of framework because it's very much a living and breathing piece of legislation that continues uh, kind of evolving. In particular, we still have a number of outstanding technical standards that are yet to be fully finalized or developed, in particular to do with risk retention, 
homogeneity for synthetic STS, um, amortization triggers and synthetic excess spread for synthetic. And a very big piece is sustainability. Again, as part of the um, a capital markets recovery package, uh, placeholders were included in the discussion regulation uh, in the amendments, essentially anticipating that um, it's probably worth exploring whether we need to develop a sustainable securitization frameworks. We're waiting very much for the report on that piece. And separately, the technical standards are yet to be developed on the um, uh, disclosure of sustainability factor on residential mortgages and auto STS transactions. And we also kind of need to see how securization will fit into green bond standards that's been kind of recently proposed. And we have a number of reports on the wider review of the securation regulation regime, not just regulation itself, but the prudential piece too. And I think on this note, I'll hand over to Pablo to kind of do the closing remarks on that last point. Thanks, uh, Maria. Pablo, go ahead. Um, thank you, Bart. Do, do we want to address um, one or two yeah. of the remaining questions before I close? Yeah, I, I saw a, a number of the questions raised. Uh, we already tried to respond to in the chat. So there's one more intriguing question, and that might be something uh, that um, is uh, for William, and uh, that's the question of Mr. Brunet. And um, uh, it starts with in the wake of the GFC, but then the bottom at uh, the, the the tail of that particular question is quite intriguing, and that is have models had to capture tail risk basically evolved uh, since the global financial crisis. And William, if you would be so kind to give uh, a brief response to that, and then we can indeed close uh, with uh, the closing remarks of Pablo. William. Yeah, there's, there's, there's different ways in which models are used for different types of transaction. So if people are doing a transaction which is not ending up in a trading book, then they will use models to try and work out, um, you know, what's the risk of the different horizons? How, can, how should things be priced? I don't think those models have subst substantially changed. So the one type of model that has sort of uh, um, somewhat disappeared because the market has somewhat disappeared is, um, is models that were applied to bespoke um, uh, uh, synthetic CDOs that were traded a lot uh, in correlation in the correlation trading market. So that market has is, 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 um, uh, is much less important than it was. Um, and so the models which found it quite difficult to match traded the prices of things as they traded in the market, um, they're no, they're no longer really, they're no longer as a subject of study and great use as they were. But, but it isn't the case that somehow the models were totally off um, for looking at default behavior, looking at um, exposures as they might end up in somebody's um, banking book or in their um, in, in their, um, uh, you know, insurance portfolio. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Mark, if I could uh, just make a, a, a quick comment on that. The, the one of the questions referred to tail risk, and I agree with what William is saying. It's not the modeling of the risks that is needs to change. The risks are there, and the models capture that risk. What I think um, is important to understand is that the issue was around investors understanding what they were buying and needing to have all the information that they can uh, that they need to make an intelligent decision and this yeah. is some of the features that Daniela was talking about, about the, the new regulations that promote more uh, transparency provide more simple structures require um, uh, models to be provided to investors so they can do their own stress uh, scenario so that's the the key thing and and addition to that there is also of course the risk retention uh, which also mitigates a bit uh, that uh, particular point 
I think um, most of the, the other questions in the Q&A uh, box uh, were uh, in the flow of uh, Maria's presentation also responded uh, and we uh, bilaterally also responded to some of the questions uh, raised uh, referring to the slide deck uh, where there is a lot of information also in the annexes so that slide deck will be made available uh, after the uh, after this uh, event to you. Uh, so I believe that um, we have done a good job in responding to all the questions that are raised in and, and thank you to all the participants for that. And uh, can I hand it over to you, Pablo, for the final comments? Thank you uh, very much, uh, Bart. Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, obviously, we have not been able to cover uh, every aspect of securitization in, in two hours, uh, but we hope that this session has provided a good overview of the basic functioning of, of this mechanism and uh, the various uh, functions it serves in the financial system. Like any financing technique, uh, there is, of course, a degree of complexity in, uh, in, and technicality in, in how securitization works. Uh, I hope that this session has tried to explain some of the, the basic structures of the market. And we have also tried to um, demystify some of the, the concepts uh, around securitization and, and explain the experience during the, the 2008 uh, financial crisis um, and how the market has been evolving in, in the European Union. Uh, I, I would stress that, you know, the most important, I think, uh, message from this session is that securitization is ultimately about um, enabling the financial system to use its resources efficiently to serve the real economy. That, that's the core of it. Uh, it is about helping banks to uh, manage their capital efficiently, to continue to make loans uh, to businesses and households. Uh, it is about reducing the concentration of risk in the banking sector and allowing uh, risks to be shared with uh, specialized institutional uh, investors, professional investors like asset managers, pension funds, uh, and ideally also insurance companies uh, if, if they uh, come back to the market in Europe. Uh, and it, it is therefore um, an instrument at the heart of the CMU because it's about connecting bank lending, which is the, the kind of um, the, the, the bulk of financing of the European economy, connecting lending to the capital markets. No, so it's it's really at the, at the core of the Capital Markets Union uh, project. Uh, as we have noted today, the framework continues to evolve. Uh, the EBA has been mandated uh, to provide a, a report um, with guidance on the development of a framework for sustainable securitization. So that is a very important report that uh, will come out uh, in due course and uh, we expect will feed into the, the future review of the securitization framework. Uh, we are expecting a report from the Commission on the on the functioning of the framework for STS and non-STS securitizations in Q1 next year. So that's another important uh, piece. And finally, as was mentioned, the European Commission has uh, asked the e the ESAS for advice on the um, uh, prudential treatment of securitization, including the bank prudential regulations and uh, solvency two for insurance companies. Uh, and that is really an important uh, piece, I think, of the regulatory puzzle, because as, as we have been explaining, as Maria explained, these prudential regulations significantly influence the incentives um, for issuers and investors to participate in the securitization market. So the very important uh, aspects of the framework. Um, so there's a lot of, of work to come, and I, I think the industry will be looking to to engage constructively with the policymakers in the in the work ahead. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, on behalf of the EBF and AFME, uh, let me thank our excellent moderator, um, uh, Professor Bart Yossen. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank our speakers, uh, Daniela Francovicchio, Maria Green. William Perodin and Steve Gandhi for sharing their expertise. Uh, I would like to thank the, the European Parliament Financial Services Forum for making this session possible uh, and my colleagues uh, Lucas Bornman at the EBF and Carolina de Giorgi at AFME for uh, helping to put together this session. Uh, and last but not least, a big thank you to the uh, to the audience, to, to all the participants. Thank you for your, your questions and, and for being here. And we hope to continue to be in contact uh, with you in the in the coming um, period.
Thank you very much.